Our first indications of Nero's depraved streak are in his early adulthood. Bear in mind that Nero spent some of his youth in the care of dancers and actors. At the time, these professionals brought no less shame than slaves or prostitutes, and they often frequented the same social settings. Between the ages of 18 and 21, Nero would often sneak out at night dressed as a slave. If you've heard of or seen the film Riot Club, about a, an exclusive drinking club for pampered, dirty rich Oxford students, this is a little bit similar. Nero and his comrades, the sons of aristocrats, would go around frolicking and wreaking havoc in taverns and brothels. He enjoyed an area around the Milvian Bridge, which was well known for being one of the most degenerate neighbourhoods. Nero and his cronies also broke into shops and houses, ransacking and looting, dividing whatever spoils back at the palace. They harassed and assaulted passers-by in the streets, and beat whoever was foolhardy enough to resist. One time, Nero taunted the wife of a senator. The senator defended her honour and actually gave Nero a black eye, forcing him to be homebound for several days. Later though, the man recognised Nero and, tormented by shame and fear for his life, committed suicide. It might have been Nero's realisation that this reckless hobby wasn't fitting for his position, and it could have fatal repercussions. Instead, he'd allow himself to vent indecent behaviour at the public games, often barbaric affairs to the modern observer. He'd encourage violence when brawls broke out, and sometimes throw food, drink, rocks and objects down at the mob. Once he even seriously wounded a commander by striking him in the head. This was the sort of behaviour that seriously angered senators, the sort of behaviour which made them want to keep Nero in a closed box during public games, not an open balcony. They also couldn't tolerate the sort of people Nero surrounded himself with. One such courtier was a former shoemaker and powerful consul named Vatinius, who was said to whisk poison into the emperor's ears. Another was Tigellinus, a Praetorian prefect and allegedly a former prostitute, poisoner and forger. Nero also handed out lavish estates to people the nobles considered disreputable, such as lyre players and favourite gladiators. Ex-slaves, eunuchs, entertainers and prostitutes also made up his inner circles. He built numerous brothels and taverns which he enjoyed visiting. He had prostitutes and dancing girls serve at his banquets, and as mentioned earlier, even intended to campaign with an army of axe-wielding concubines. We could also give Nero the benefit of the doubt and say all these positions and privileges were awarded on merit. This is fairly unlikely though. We could also say that surrounding himself with like-minded artists and hedonists was his way of opposing what he might have seen as stuffy, almost parental attitudes which needed fixing. Suffice to say that all of these types of people were considered morally reprehensible at the time, and Nero alienated the upper classes with the company he kept. It's now time to discuss that most inviolable of taboos, and Nero's partaking in it, incest with his mother. So what is the evidence for this? I'm going to cut to the chase and spare you all some rather dry, close analysis. All the ancient sources state that Nero and his mother behaved too intimately for comfort sometime between 58 and 59. We're talking passionate kissing and at least a sexual advance from one of them. Some sources go further to say Nero and his mother Agrippina had a sexual affair, but those sources are generally believed to be unreliable. Tacitus, usually our best source for Nero, states Agrippina offered herself sexually to Nero, but he never actually states the relationship was consummated. A later important source doubts whether anything inappropriate happened at all, and wonders whether it was all merely a rumour. The contemporary source, which Tacitus later used for his writing, said this. In the middle of the day, when Nero was inebriated and jolly, Agrippina would sometimes offer herself to Nero. Their kisses and affection for one another alarmed Nero's advisers so much that Seneca decided to put an immediate stop to it. He invited one of Nero's favourite concubines, Acte, to quell his lust and warn Nero what the political repercussions would be if he entered into an affair with his mother. Nero then apparently distanced himself from Agrippina and never visited her in private. Bonde, Roman historian Champlin, gives us two strong reasons to believe that the incest did happen. One, word did go around of Nero and Agrippina's incest, consummated or not in Nero's lifetime. Yet, there is no evidence he suppressed or rejected the idea. This shows he wasn't embarrassed by it, or he simply didn't care enough to confirm or deny it. The second reason to believe there was some form of incestuous relationship between mother and son is this. There was apparently a courtesan who Nero particularly favoured because of her resemblance to Agrippina. All the ancient sources apparently agreed on this, and 3rd century historian Cassius Dio wrote, when he toyed with the girl herself, 
or display their charms to others, he would say that he was wont to have intercourse with his mother. So what are we to believe? This is both the beauty and the frustration of ancient history. We're dealing with a lot of biased sources. Even Tacitus, despite being the most critical and impartial of our sources, himself was hostile to Nero and used many biased sources himself. These earlier sources might in turn have been happy to pass off rumour as fact because it suited their agendas. Ancient Romans liked to talk about sex. Oh stop thinking about sex! And they particularly liked to slander people they didn't like with it, even if it meant making up all sorts of rubbish. The fact we don't have evidence of Nero suppressing the rumour is interesting, but then so much is lost to us from two millennia ago that evidence might just be some of it. The short answer is, it could have happened, but we just simply can't make any conclusive statements as to whether it was true or not. And it's useful to keep these ideas in mind, the biased sources, convenient, dirty rumours, the lot, for the rest of this video. Now let's move on to some of the more bizarre of Nero's relationships, which have simply baffled historians for centuries. The first one of interest to us was with a man named Pythagoras, and not this guy. Pythagoras was a freed slave. We don't know very much about him. All we know is that, according to Tacitus, he was one of, quote, that filthy herd of Nero's courtiers and probably not in an advisory role. We're told that Nero married the man in a public ceremony before huge crowds as a major event at a party. All the trappings of a regular marriage were there. Preparations for a dowry, a marriage bed, wedding torches, everything. Besides the obvious fact that two men marrying each other at the time was weird, Nero was apparently the one wearing the bridal veil. That is, Nero, the emperor of Rome, was dressed up as a bride, marrying a man at a public wedding when he was already married. But it gets even more bizarre. We're told that after the wedding ceremony, Nero, still dressed as a bride, began to moan and shriek in the manner of a virgin being deflowered. We're also told that later, an extremely bizarre show was staged. Nero was no longer dressed as a bride, but in animal skins. Now, listen carefully. We're told by Suetonius that he was, quote, let loose from a cage and attacked the private parts of men and women who were bound to stakes, and when he had satisfied his lust, was dispatched by Pythagoras. Now, if you're asking, what the f did I just hear? Believe me, lots of historians have thought the same. Champlin suggests it might have been Nero's initiation to an obscure Eastern cult. The evidence is a little bit far-fetched, and Nero, though superstitious himself, was usually quite contemptuous of cults. He even urinated on the image of the Syrian goddess, the only deity he had ever believed in. The other possible explanation makes much more sense. That is if you look at the incident in the context of the Saturnalia festival. This took place every year in mid to late December to honour the Roman god Saturn. Besides private gift giving, dining sacrifices to Saturn, the main event was a huge, class-cutting, orgiastic party like you can't even imagine. The idea was that for several days, Roman social norms and structures were completely overturned. Masters served their slaves, gambling was allowed, virgins were deflowered in front of their fathers, noble women were publicly mounted by their servants. The whole thing essentially pushed the boundaries of acceptable Roman behaviour. This same role reversal can be seen in the entire ceremony of Nero's marriage to Pythagoras. Marriage to a man instead of a woman, check. Nero playing the bride instead of the groom, check. Nero acting as a depraved animal, check. And what about the reference to oral sex on the men and women tied to stakes? In Roman times, the person receiving oral pleasure was usually in a position of power compared with the person giving oral pleasure. Here we have the most powerful man in Rome debasing himself by giving sexual pleasure, most unacceptably to men. At the same time he was behaving like an animal, defiling their genitalia. Champlin tells us that this whole animal part of the ceremony was a parody of a form of capital punishment called damnatio ad bestius, where bound criminals were exposed, often naked, to wild beasts and torn up in arenas before large crowds. The beasts were then sometimes killed by gladiators or others for the sake of public entertainment. Hence, this explains why Nero was, quote, dispatched by Pythagoras after the tied victims were sexually mauled by Nero the beast. Again, we have another reversal of roles. Pythagoras, the former slave, kills his master Nero, except that here Nero is the beast and Pythagoras is, you guessed it, the master. We don't have that much additional evidence from Pythagoras besides the fact that he and Nero would appear in public. Some hostile sources refer to Pythagoras as Nero's husband and Nero as Pythagoras' wife. What can we make of this? Again, we really can't make any conclusions. I'll leave you with these points though as food for thought. One. 
don't forget bias sources. The marriage might just have been confined to the crazy Saturnalia festival. Just because Nero was seen with Pythagoras after, it doesn't mean they seriously considered themselves a married couple. It could well have been a joke, then passed off as fact by observers. Two, Nero conceived himself as an artist. The world was his stage, and an act could have been for life. Three, even Nero knew that having multiple spouses was disgraceful by Roman standards. And it's difficult to believe he would have allowed himself to be publicly debased as a wife, given the societal implications of a man acting as a woman. And I mean acting as a woman outside of an artistic context. Nero cross-dressed in his plays all the time, but appearing as a woman on stage and appearing as a woman in public appearances were two completely different things. Next on the list of Nero's scandalous affairs is that with the famous eunuch, Sporus. This, unlike Pythagoras, should perhaps be treated with a little more seriousness. After the death of Poppea Sabina in 65 AD, Nero was devastated, even though he had probably been the cause of her death. When he heard there was a woman who looked like her, he sent for her and kept her with him. But she clearly wasn't enough for Nero. In circumstances that escape our knowledge, Nero set his eyes on a young Roman boy who to him was the spitting image of his lost wife. We're told he brought the young boy to his palace and had him castrated. From there, he did all he could to turn him into a woman. He spent lavishly on all sorts of professionals, presumably dressmakers, jewelers, and makeup artists, among others, and even rewarded them with great state honors. We're told Nero married Sporus with all the ceremonies of the time, even a dowry. They often appeared together in public, sometimes traveling in a litter, and we're told they kissed fondly. Sporus was addressed as lady, empress or mistress, and Nero presented Sporus as his wife. So what does this mean? Well, it's difficult to compare it to anything because it's so isolated and completely out of the ordinary, even by ancient Roman standards. Killing your wife and in your grief making a woman out of a castrated prepubescent boy doesn't exactly fill out the history books. Marrying prepubescent women in Rome was borderline acceptable, although consummation before their mid-teens would have been frowned upon. Marrying a young boy, even if castrated and turned into a woman, was serious cause for concern. We'll never be able to know the exact workings of Nero's mind, but the ancients believe that Nero's relationship with Sporus was an example of Nero's uh, sexual depravity. Historians have been tempted to see it this way as well. Even if Nero's relationship with Sporus wasn't abominably depraved by Roman standards, since homosexuality was only frowned on if you were the passive receiver, the whole thing certainly indicates some sort of sexual dominance, especially when you consider the castration. But then why marry Sporus? Why not just castrate him and bed him in private? Oh my god. Yeah, it sounds really bad, but you get what I mean. Why didn't he just do it on the down low? The story continues to baffle historians. More recently, Champlin suggests that it was genuine grief and shame for the killing of his wife and his unborn child that led him down this road. He suggests their relationship had less to do with upending gender roles or displaying sexual dominance and more about a grieving man trying to replace his dead wife. Not that this was in any way a normal thing to do. Of course, this would involve some serious mental instability. Regardless of what might have happened in the bedroom, it was reprehensible. Snatching a young boy, brutally emasculating him, and using him to fill a personal need, be it sexual, psychological, or both, was twisted even by the standards of the day. Interestingly, Champlin also suggests that it would have been very unlikely for Nero not to treat the whole thing as some sort of joke. The public wedding, with all the normal conventions, the betrothal, when this was clearly between two men and Nero was already married. Even Sporus' name could be taken as an attempt at humour. Sporus is Latin for seed. The idea of naming a castrated boy seed or semen could be an example of dark humour on Nero's part. Finally, the marriage to Sporus might have a Saturnalian streak to it, a reversal or suspension of norms for a celebratory purpose, though it seems their affair was a little bit more serious than Nero's relationship with Pythagoras. Sporus stayed with Nero until his death 18 months later. We have evidence of the pair kissing each other tenderly in public. When Nero was nearing the end of his life, he wanted Sporus to die with him, but Sporus fled Rome instead. One obscure source suggests Sporus had betrayed Nero's plans to his companions because of how despicably Nero had treated him. If you're confused after hearing all this, you're not the only one. Nero is a complete enigma. Many historians have simply considered him a wretch, 
Others, like Champlin, considered him a romantic. Champlin claims that despite his many concubines and instances of repulsive, twisted sexual behaviour, Nero only loved three people, all of whom he married. It might be true, but there is simply no way of knowing this. So here's a little recap. In all cases, do not forget about biased sources. Nero was a wretched public nuisance and thug in his late adolescence. He surrounded himself with figures who were totally unsavory for the time, many of whom would be considered unsavory even now. He may or may not have felt sexual attraction towards his mother, and she may or may not have propositioned herself to him. Nero threw extremely depraved parties, which were likely his attempts at shock value. He became the bride to a former slave, very possible during the festival of Saturnalia, and took the role of a feral, hypersexual beast. Finally, Nero forcibly married and castrated a young boy who looked like his dead wife, Poppea. That, I'm sure you'll agree, is not the best track record. Add to that additional horrific charges of sodomizing his stepbrother Britannicus before killing him and forcing his dead mother's lover Pallas to fillet him, and you get a very disturbing picture of a sexually deviant, violent man with a disturbing psyche. That said, it's easy to see why Nero's been tagged as a madman. Imagine hearing everything above without any explanation or context. I think we've seen how in each case the reality is a little bit more complex, and the narrative is very biased. Though we can't possibly know if Nero was completely sane either, it's important to consider rational motives. Now ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to the grand finale. Have a break, get comfortable, do what you need to do, but you probably won't want to miss out on what's coming. The instances and events which by appearance alone make Nero out to be one of the most evil men to have ever lived. Mm -hmm.